uh, gold. Now what we're going to do is we're going to measure gold. We're going to put the price of gold up here because a lot of people consider the price of gold uh, to be a valid measure of preserving wealth, maintaining uh, Preventing for your money from depreciating, right? And when you look at this thing, when money goes from hundred dollars to, uh, sorry, when not money, when U.S. dollar goes from hundred dollars to three dollars and seventy cents, that's a currency, right? That's not money because one of the things money has to be has to be a good store of value, and currency is not a good store of value. So when the when that saying comes along that says cash is money, it is true. You need to be liquid right but cash is only money for short periods of time you don't want to be in cash too long right we'll talk about this a little bit more when we graph some of these things but let's put gold on here in 1900 right gold was twenty dollars and sixty seven cents so gold I'm gonna put this twenty dollars and 67 cents okay and this is gold put this guy this way gold so let's put gold as gold All right use the gold marker so this is gold So gold was twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents, and what we're going to do here, we're not going to adjust for inflation. We're not going to, because twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents in nineteen hundred, in two thousand and seventeen dollars was was five hundred and seventeen dollars. Right? So twenty dollars was equivalent your purchasing power if you take this into consideration, right? So if you had this money, not money, I keep the wrong, using the wrong word, but this currency, if you had your wealth in this, right, and inflation was doing this, right, if we we're going to measure how much $20.67 was equivalent to in these dollars, it was worth $517, right? But we're just going to use... The value there this is 10 here this tick so 20 is around here All right so if you put you know you bought $20 worth of gold in 1900 and the government didn't confiscate confiscate your gold in this period because the US government is a, a period in 19 uh, I wrote this down. I knew this history before. Um, oh, I wrote it down in the previous iteration. I didn't copy it over to this one because I wasn't going to talk about it. But there was a certain period, a few years here, uh, during World War II, where the U.S. government confiscated everyone's gold, right? And sort of everyone had to take it into the banks, and the banks took that gold in at this price. And then a few years later, the government raised the price of gold because this was not fluctuating the way or controlled the world it was completely controlled it was set it was set in stone right now it's supposed to be fluctuating based on market principles but it's really not it's sort of controlled as well in a big way but in during the world war ii period or build up to world war ii the u.s government confiscated people's gold and the banks took them in and a few years later the banks sold on a higher value right so they made pretty good money pretty good returns considering the amount of time involved right so Twenty dollars. If you put twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents of gold in nineteen hundred, right now gold is trading at uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, a few days ago anyway. When I looked this up, it's trading at one thousand two hundred thirty dollars. Right. So let's put that on here. Oops, took off the wrong side. One thousand two hundred and thirty dollars. One thousand two hundred and $30 right so this is 1,000 this is 1,000 2,000 is up here because that's 10,000 so $1,230 is like pretty close to 1,000 
let's say it's about here okay so right now if we just think about these as straight lines this straight line this was a bad place for you to be in you would have lost you lost everything because your purchasing power has also decreased right it's, it's a double whammy your money value of your money has decreased and your purchasing power has decreased this is supposed to be a measure of this but it's really not okay so keep this in mind and gold basically mirrors this right to a certain degree because one thing we can do once we start putting things on graphs visually uh, we can do a table format too, but it's more difficult to visualize the stuff in table format. What you can do is start uh, doing calculation, taking ratios, some stuff we're going to talk about in series four of the language of mathematics. But what you can do is take the slope of this graph and take the slope of this graph, which is basically rise over run, right? And rise over run and see which one is a steeper slope. The one that's a steeper slope if you're invested in it, that's better because it's giving you faster returns, right? So for this graph, for this visualization, what we're thinking about is which one is gonna be a steeper slope, right? On the upside, not on the downside. This is one of the, the only one that I took or I found where the price has decreased over time. I actually, I think textiles I looked at as well, but I didn't really bother graphing that because that's very, small scale and technology actually goes down as well the cost of technology goes down over time as well and that's really cool to look at but we're, we're going to take a look at it at a different time and a different video that we've set up for right so gold has gone from twenty dollars to twelve hundred dollars right and you can do a multiple of this right you could do this if you want to figure out what the multiple is for the cpi 244 divided by 8.9 that's 27.4 times and one two three zero divided by 20 points is 59 times right wow so if this is let's say this was 30 times this is 59 let's say 60 times so the slope of this even though that doesn't appear so right now because we're on a log scale right gold has increased twice as fast as the CPI which is a good indication of gold based on government measures based on measures is a good place to store value right is it a good currency do people does everyone trade gold I don't know how to well I do know I did geology so I have I can test test it and figure out if it's gold if it's malleable right if it's not metallic you can figure out if something is gold. Uh, I know uh, I've talked to someone where um, they said some people go to, if you wanna, if you wanna find, uh, use a method to find gold in places where there might be gold, right? You don't have to go out in the forest into the rivers and start pan, pan as panhandling they call it, and start digging for gold. Some people take magnets and they go to thrift stores right and they take anything that's gold colored and they put a magnet to it and if it doesn't stick to it they buy it because gold is not magnetic it's not ferrous right I think it's ferrous if I remember terminology correctly then if magnet doesn't stick to it if it's really gold colored then it might be gold and that's one of the things you could use to go searching for gold right go look for treasure right so gold is a good place to preserve wealth based on cpi numbers but this double slope really doesn't do anything to help you compensate for price of inf uh, price of tuitions going up stuff like that right now the next measure we're going to look at we're going to look at the s p s p 500 the stock market wall street sort of what we talked about in the previous video or reading mr armstrong's article right so the s p in 1900 okay and this is uh sort of it wasn't called the s p in 1900 it was called the composite index and the composite index uh i found only one source which gave me the 1900 number there's multiple sources i found for the 1920 number and stuff like this but the 1900 number 
the S&P 500, if you want to think about it as the S&P 500, was 6.1. Okay. So 6.1 is under the 8, somewhere around here. I'm just going to put it far enough down that we can actually see. Here, let's move this guy a little bit higher up. Now we're a little bit more accurate, I guess, and get rid of that 10 value and give this guy room. Okay. So 6.8 or 6.1 is around here. Okay. Just a straight up SP value is the last time I look is 2459. 2000, let's say 2450, right? 2000. 400 oops lock this one up 2450 2450 2450 and that guy that's 1000 here this tick so 2000 is going to be up here The slope of this is much better than the slope of the other two, that's for sure. Let's look at the multiple on this. 2,450 divided by 6.1. 401 is the multiple. 402 is the multiple, right? That's pretty good. Now, one thing with the S&P is you can't just... Well, you can. You could buy the S&P and just let it ride, right? But one thing with the S&P happens is the stock market, if you buy the right number of stocks, what happens is they give you dividends, money back, a certain percentage per year. And that's basically the main gist of our current economic system, which is just chasing growth. And that's a certain flaw in our economic system as well because everything, things don't grow in forever, right? So... Our current system, our current eco economy, is based on growth, and a certain percentage. I want to S and P. Let's put the S and P up here in our thing as well, right? So it's based on growth, and this slope is much better. But what happens with the S and P is there's certain stocks you can buy that give you dividends every year. So, you know, it varies, it fluctuates, it goes from anything from less than 1% up to like 6, 7, 8% more aggressive ones, right? But the average S&P return during this period, I looked it up, I, you know, seems a little sketchy, some of it, uh, because first of all, um, not, you know, no individual is going to be invested in for 117 years, it's not going to happen. It's going to be institutions to a certain degree, right? And what happens is, basically, if you take out uh, the inflation factors, the CPI, the devaluation of the currency, you lose a little bit of percent there as well, right? But one of the measures on the high end, if you include you getting dividends and not spending your dividends, because what happens, most people invest in dividend stocks because they get a certain amount of income they're called income stocks i believe they're called income stocks if I remember correctly and you get a certain percentage back every year and they use that as expense money right funds that they want to they live by right but if you on the extreme end if you invest the 6.1 dollars right in 1900 in 1900 dollars in the s p and took out your dividend Right? You didn't reinvest that dividend. You just went for this growth. This is what you would have. right? But if you took that dividend, all of that dividend being given to you, and put it all back into play, right? and this is the concept of compound growth, the value jumps up a lot. And this is on the extreme side. And I found some numbers, and the calculation I did was um, I basically took it being a 7% growth. Okay, because average, I believe, the dividend return for the S&P was 4%. Uh, 
uh, per year if you average it out for this period, for this period of time. Um, actually, it went for a shorter period of time, so I'm not sure even if dividends existed here. So we're thinking about absolute extreme. Okay, so four percent dividend return. The growth rate was you know two point eight percent. So I took it to be seven percent growth. Right? If you put six point one dollars in 1900 into the S and P at seven percent growth for 100 and 17 years that's what we're talking about right your return was 16,000 okay no one would have done this most people I, I know and that I've known that play Wall Street play the stock market um, they don't reinvest all dividends into the same play same game it wouldn't be a smart decision to do, but basically, well, it would be to a certain degree, depending on where you're in uh, at certain points in life, I guess. But 1600 would be here. Okay, oops. Squished it. Okay, that would be 1600 So your growth could either be this on the minimum side, if you took out all your dividends, or the growth would be this. And that multiple is whew, way more. One six zero 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 divided by six point one is two thousand six hundred and twenty two times return. That's very good. That's very good, right? Now let's take a look at some other measures. Okay. On the same level, if we take a look at uh, and I took this and it comes up um, the reason I took this because this company has is having a huge role to play in our current political and economic system. But basically, Renaissance Technologies is a tech company that was started not a tech company, it was an investment company, uh, hedge fund managers basically that came about because of the advent of technology, because of the advent of computing. What we talked about in the previous video, right. Really, this is, this is, all these videos are sort of connected, right? Which Martin Armstrong talked about, right? Behind the curtain, the full Monty, how automation came into play in our current political economic system. And this company has had a huge role to play in our current political and economic system. They were one of the main backers of both parties uh, in the United States last year or this year, I guess, last year, I guess right so they were one of the main backers main players and policy makers to a certain degree because those funding an election get to decide the policy of that governing body to a certain degree right so this company came about in 1900s or not 1900s 1980s right because of the advent of technology computer power okay and what they were able to do they were able to come up with programs to do trading on a more frequent basis and uh, use algorithms right and their return from 19 their main fund one of their main funds from 1994 okay if you invested $100 with them in 1994 100 94 I'm just gonna put a little dash 94 is that gonna show up I don't know if it's gonna show up for you guys right $100 and that's 94 right in 1994 so we're talking about this is 2020 2010 2000 1990 right 1994 is here so if you invested here, one hundred dollars, about here, and we're talking you right here, somewhere around here anyway. If you invested one hundred dollars in nineteen ninety four in this fund, if you were given the opportunity to do so, your return, one hundred dollars, would have gotten you back. Twenty-two thousand six hundred sixty-one dollars, 
right? <laughs> Twenty-two thousand six hundred and sixty-one dollars. Twenty-two thousand. That's oh, sixteen thousand is not up here. My apologies, gang. If this is ten thousand, that's twenty thousand, right? So sixteen is here. My bad. Somewhere around here, anyway, right? So twenty-two thousand six hundred and sixty-one dollars is higher than this. So that's ten thousand, twenty thousand goes up here. Right? So take a look at this. The slope of this dwarfs like these guys, right? And this sort of plays out for us in something called differential accumulation, something we talked about in ASMR math previously, right? When we talk about disruptive innovation, and basically what we're seeing right now is automation in regards to trading stocks, right? From the 1980s, right? 2010, 2000, 1990, 1980, coming into play, technology coming into play here, where the people playing that system at this time, in 10 years, were able to create a fund that in 1994, if you put $100 in it, gave you a return of $22,661. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. And the multiple on that is... Did I do the multiple calculation? I don't even think I did the multiple calculation. The multiple calculation is, oh, what is it? It's just two, it's 226, right? The multiple is 226 times in a matter of, oh, and one thing I forgot. This isn't in 2017, it was 2014. So we're actually here, 2010, 2014. It's actually here, right? A little, little bit out, so it's a dot. It's not on the tick. So you have 226 times your return. And for fun, I I just I punched it in because this what what this return is for this period was 75 71% return compounded yearly, right? So 71% return. Now think about this. The CPI, the purple. And actually, let's put the table on here. The purple here, or sorry, not the purple. Oh yeah, the purple here. This was the min. No, sorry, the pink. The pink was the CPI, right? The pink is the CPI. This was supposed to compensate for inflation, right? And inflation is supposed to be around two, two to three percent per year. These guys were getting return of seventy-one percent per year, right? Renaissance. Rentec. Let's call it Rentec. Okay. That's these guys here. And for fun, what I did was I took that measure that growth and i applied it come on stick away and i applied it hey and i applied it from 1900 and i took we did the thing here i took a hundred dollars and I did it from 1920. I didn't even do it from 1900. I did it from 1920 because initially I was just going to do things from 1920. Your return was to, if you put $100 in 1920, which is 1910, 1920, we're not going to write the numbers because it doesn't make sense. Right. If you put the number here, $100, 1920, right? Your return was 2 times 10 to the 23. <laughs> 2 times 10 to the 23. 71%, the same rate of return as this. So if you want to visualize where this graph is, because all you really need to do is take the line created here, right? Over here. Let's do it with the ruler. Okay. So because the growth rate is going to be the same, right? The growth rate to a certain degree is rise over run, right? Basically, it's going to be, right? Uh, the percent rate on it anyway, compounded. But what you can do is just get an approximation of where this is going to go. 
Use the same slope and just transpose this over here. And keep in mind that each one of these ticks is log 10. And what this was is 10 to 23. You could buy the world, maybe? I don't know. It's past trillions, right? I should have actually figured out what that word is to describe 2 times 10 to the 23. Now, going back to more realistic, or not realistic, this is realistic, right? This company, the same company had, and this was private fund, by the way. Uh, you, only had, you could only have connections to be able to buy in that fund or a lot of wealth to be able to buy in that fund. It wasn't open to the public. This same company had funds existing for a certain period there where they lost a certain percentage. So the slope was down, right? Those were the public funds that you can invest in. The private ones, slopes were like this, the two I looked at. And the public ones, there was only two public ones they had or one public one. That one public one was a declining investment, not a good investment, right? Take that however way you want. Okay. Now what we're going to do is take a look at another place where you could have stored your wealth in a big way, in a big way. Okay. And that's in art, right? Because art has been one of the greatest investments you could have made over time. Okay. And that investment, we're going to talk about something that's dear to my heart if you're watching, watching these videos. We're going to take probably the most important comic book on the market since we're doing we've reached a level where we're talking about extremes right as soon as we hit this we've hit extremes returns right so let's do something that's compatible to this art is one of the best places you could invest in paintings well-known painters their prices they're astronomical i don't follow that market but i do follow the comic book market right so if you bought Action Comics number one, the first appearance of Superman, I'm just going to put Superman here. Superman. But it's Action Comics number one. Oh, I've got to write this the other way. Really, it's not Superman. Action Comics. But I'm going to call it Superman so we know what it is. Superman. So if you bought Action Comics number one in 1938, because it came out in 1938, its price was 10 cents, right? Its price was 10 cents. So 19, and it's 1938, so let me put this here too. Let's do that, Let's make an offer room for it. 10 cents. Nineteen thirty-eight. Okay. So that's 1910, 1920, 1930, 1938 is here. So let's see. 10, 20, 30. So we're here. 1930. And you bought it at 10 cents. So you basically, you, I should have had another scale here. My bad. Right? I totally forgot about that. Right? Because one then 10 cents would be here, right? So let's not make it 10 cents. Let's make it you bought 10 of them just to, so we can put it on this graph, right? Initially I'd gone, and by the way, 10 cents in 1938 was equivalent to $1.73 uh, in 2017 dollars, right? So 10 cents was $1.73 in 2017 dollars. So even the price of comic books hasn't stayed up with, you know, surpassed the CPI measure, right? If comic books had only stuck with CPI, took the rate of inflation into consideration, we should have been able to buy comic books at $1.73 in our stores right now. But comic books cost $5 right now three well anywhere between three to five dollars right now your basic comic book right so that's gone up huge as well that hasn't that's sort of showing you where the cpi really doesn't take into consideration certain things so instead of buying one 
action comics number one let's say we bought 10 so that makes it a dollar right so let's say it's one dollar 1938 and we're sitting right here okay 1910 1920 1930 1940 so we're sitting right around here Oops. So that's Action Comics number one. Okay. Since I only did the calculation for one of them, I'm going to have to multiply this. But basically what happened in 2014 and 2016, I believe, as well, Action Comics number one, uh, the higher grade ones, uh, which is grade nine. Nine means it's very fine near mint, right? Near mint minus. Like, that's, it's in good quality. It's in good shape sold for 3.2 million dollars right so 10 cents if you bought it and if you kept it in good shape would have returned 3.2 million dollars right one dollar you know 10 of those if you assumed it was going to keep the same value okay because if you had if you had 10 then it wasn't as rare as it is now right because i don't i believe it's less than 10 that are uh, graded at uh, point nine point zero, right? I think there's only four or five of those around. But I actually live in a city right now, Victoria. I talked to a comic book store owner that told me that he actually personally knows five people that have Action Comics number one in their possession, lower grades. I don't know what the grades are. We didn't, we didn't talk about it, but I'm assuming it's lower grades as well. But supposedly there's five of them in my city alone. That's one reason I moved to the city as well. It's got a huge comic book history to it. Uh, a lot of comic book people here okay but 10 cents would have got you 3.2 million so 10 of them would have got you 32 million pretty sweet if the value kept the same and just to give you um, a comparison of five a 5.5 5. 5, um, action comics number one sold for about a million dollars so the different pr the different price between the nine and the 5.5 5, was two million dollars three times right but basically one dollar investment in action comics number one in 1938 would have got you 32 million dollars how am i going to put this on here that works okay 32 million dollars wow i hadn't planned on doing 10 comic books so we're actually up here right we're above scale so we're gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna extend this oops and we're basically up here oops. If it kept, kept the same value, right? One dollar, thirty-two million dollars, uh, thirty-two million times your return. Wow, right? And the slope of this is combat compatible to this one, right? It's compatible to these guys. The return of these guys right. one big difference it is less these guys were able to get that kind of return in a short period of time right now let's kick it down a notch and take a look at uh, the wages that we earn how have wages varied over time okay now in 1900 in 1938, I did it for 1938 because um, we had data available for that. I also looked at salaries. So let's talk about salaries. In 1938, basically, hourly wage was uh, 25 cents an hour. Okay. So if that's a dollar, so we're back down here again below this. So we're not going to look at hourly wages. But just to give you a heads up, an hour... Your, the minimum wage was 25 cents an hour, and right now the minimum wage is minimum uh, wage is 7.2 um, dollars an hour. Okay. In 1968, 
the minimum wage was 1.6 dollars so 1960 so if we're talking about i should make the ticks here what are we at that's 1940 1950 1960 that's 1970. 1970 the minimum wage was dollar something dollar 60 and right now it's that's 7.5 7.7.2 so if we do the minimum wage right min wage min wage let's throw this on here for for the fun of it so minimum wage is this guy here the orange okay minimum wage was a dollar sixty dollar sixty in 1968 okay dollar 60 in 1968 1940 50 60 70 so dollar 60 is like here and Minimum wage right now is seven twenty five. Seven twenty five. Okay. And that puts you about here. If you're doing minimum wage, you're at it again. Right? Because one thing you have to consider is you look at these guys, right? This was the S&P, okay? This was gold, right? So gold was above S&P. If you come over here, the S&P, both the minimum and the maximum, are above gold. So that means if you consider these to be systems, right? And they are systems, they're different economic systems. If you're invested in gold, you could have easily bought into the S&P, right? But over here, if you're invested in gold, it's not as easy to buy into the S&P. You get less of the S&P for your gold. So what's happening when you see a crossover, right, with the slopes, with the lines, when you see a crossover, basically jumping from an upper system to a lower system is easy to do because it's based on its US dollars, based on its currency value, is valued more so you can jump into it. But when one system is above another system, it's way more difficult to jump into the other system, right? This economic system, if you want to invest in, right? Or you have to buy a smaller chunk. So over here, you know, I don't know what gold prices were here, $100, but if you're invested in gold here, and these guys are up here, or Action Comics is up there. You, hard time, hard time. If you look at 1938, the minimum wage in 1938 was uh, 25 cents, right? So you could have bought, you work two and a half hours, you could have bought one Action Comics, right? If you worked, you had to, uh, Sorry, you could have, for one hour, you could have bought two and a half action comics, right? So if you worked an hour, right? Uh, you worked four hours, which is a dollar, you could have bought 10 action comics, right? If you bought 10 action comics in 1938 with your 25 cent minimum wage income, right? You were in the game for all of these, right? In 2017 and before that. But the price of Action Comics hasn't gone up in that, that amount. I believe in 19, uh, or Superman number one, I can't remember if it was Superman number one or Action Comics. I'm pretty sure it was Superman number one, not Action Comics number one, which we're talking about. In 1970, it was worth $100. In 1980, Superman number one was worth $1,200. And I remember in 1994, which is right here, 1992, 1993, Action Comics number one, sold for $160,000 and at that time was breaking records, right? So Action Comics number one, let's put this up here too, Action Comics number one, because I know this, I heard about this in uh, at a convention, I believe, $160,000. 
94. Let's say 92. I think it was 92. Okay. And let's put the dot there. So 1992 cost you 160,000 or 10,000. I forgot to put a little tick on the 100,000 here. So 1992, which is about the same as 1994, this thing costs you this much, $160,000, right? Not $200,000, $200,000 would be up there a little bit more. $160,000, oops, 94 is going to be further over, isn't it? It's going to be here. Hopefully I'm doing this right. Maybe. So it was like here, right? That would be Action Comics number one. It pretty much fits a linear scale on a logarithmic graph, which is a good thing, right? It could have maybe done this a little bit, price gone up, or fluctuated, comes down. On a log scale, it's difficult. Looks like a linear line to a certain degree, right? So if you bought four Action Comics number ones in 1938, working minimum wage, four hours of time, stored that over time, right now, in 2017, you could have $32 million. So keep this in mind. In every period in our lives, right, there are times where even though you're not in one of these systems, there are investments you can make that could possibly increase your slope, give you a better return than what you're in right now, right? If we go back to the minimum wage here, in 1968, the minimum wage, is that where we were? The minimum wage uh, puts you a dollar, uh, seven dollars and 25 cents, right? That's the slope there. So if you're here right now, you should be thinking, what type of systems can you invest in here, possibly closer to your range here, that can kick you up down the road into a higher return right you're looking for a steeper slope are there any steep slopes coming in right and there are there are okay um while we're on this actually let's do the salaries as well um, because I'm, the salaries we're just going to do one salary uh from 1900 uh, because that way we can put it on the scale here right the average income in 1900 okay individual income in 1900 across the board was $438, which is equivalent to like $12,000 in 2017 uh, dollars, right? If you take the deflation or rate of inflation into consideration, devaluation of your currency, but we're still gonna stick with the $1,900, right? So $438 in 1920 was $1,400, but we're gonna stick with the 1900. So 1900, Average salary was four hundred thirty-eight dollars. Okay, four hundred thirty-eight minimum wage salary. So this should really be salary as well. Wage four hundred and thirty-eight would be around here. Okay, and the average average salary right now. This was, you know, depending on different measures, you could measure average salary, individual salary, or you could measure average income per household i took one of the one of the measures like personal average for one person is thirty thousand dollars household is fifty six thousand dollars that's basically usually one person full-time at least and one person part-time or two people full-time but the average i took as being forty eight thousand okay on a log scale it's not gonna these numbers and based on the other graphs that we have are not going to make that much of a difference right so forty eight thousand dollars so that's ten thousand that's twenty two thousand forty eight thousand would be around here maybe a little bit lower but i don't want to overlap too much right so what we have to do is take a look at the slope and that's the slope there that's the slope there right? the multiple is 110 times 
And the multiple here is not 110 times. The <laughs> multiple here, we could just do it, but the multiple here is. That, that. No, let's just do it. We got 7.25 divided by 1.6. It's 4.5 times. And there's different states have different minimum wages. Massachusetts has the highest one right now at $11. Okay. So if you're making just a salary, right? If you're making hourly salary, you need to think about systems. If you want to function in the society, if you want to have better returns, better growth, because that's what this is sort of about, then you need to think about different systems that you can put your money in. Okay. One other thing we're going to take a look at, two other things we're going to take a look at. We're going to look at home prices. Okay. Home prices in 1900 were seeing a bubble. They were seeing a peak. In 1900, home prices, an average home cost around, this is what I came across, it was hard to find this information, really difficult to find this information, it was around $5,000, okay? In 1920, the average home price was $3,000. Okay. So 5000 3000 so they're saying $5,000 here was the average home price in 1900. And in 1920, which is this tick here, is around 3000 so around here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the average. I'm going to make it $4,000. Home. Let's make this home. House. Not home, but house. Okay. So light green is house. And... Let's put the average price in 1900 4000 And keep in mind, you know, what type of houses you were getting at that period. Keep in mind that most places didn't have electricity. Right? 4000 will be around here. Right? So those are houses. I should have brought other tape. Oh, I do have other tape. Let's tape these down. That way they're not sticking up. Okay. Let's take these guys down too. And let's take these guys down while we're at it. There we go. So four thousand dollars was average house in nineteen ninety, and in two thousand and seventeen, the average house in the United States, the median, then the median house is not the average. The median house, and the median is we're going to talk about this when we do series on statistics. But median is the middle number, is three hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Three hundred seven thousand dollars. That was the median. So three hundred. So, no, oh, I put in too many zeros on this one. Silly me. That's a million. We got, let's make this one. And that should be $100,000. Right? Of all the places to make little mistakes, right? So that's $100,000. So it's going to be $307,000, which is going to be somewhere around here, All right? That's what a house is. And that's the slope there, right? And the multiple on that thing is going to be 307 divided by 4,000. It's 76 times your return, right? Gold was divided by 20 was 61 times right inflation was supposed to be only 27 times right your money is devalued 96 percent right this loss is purchasing power right what's this guy that's the minimum wage your wage has only gone up was it a hundred times? Huh? 
110 times, but house prices have jumped up. Seventy-six times. Not bad. Considering your wages, I guess. You have to work 10 years to buy a house here. Well, less than 10 years. It's about the same. Okay. But there's a big difference in, in living expenses, right? Your purchasing power, your cost of living, interest rates. Actually, interest rates are pretty low right now. Very nicely low. Okay. Now, we're going to look at one more thing, one more measure. And that's something that's playing out right now. It's come into play because of the same reason that these guys were in play, right? Renaissance technologies, Renaissance technologies, how they've come to play, right? Using automation, computer power to generate wealth, right? Wealth that we can measure with US dollars, okay? One thing that's come into play recently is something we talked about. I sort of gave you my opinion on it, which is cryptocurrencies, right? You know, Tom's, when it comes to thinking about them as investing or you thinking about them as currency or thinking about them as commodity, for me, cryptocurrencies are sort of faith-based, trust-based, and they also have certain aspects of a commodity because they're based on scarcity. One of the reasons that the US dollar has depreciated lost 96% of his purchasing power, right? Is because, because there's more and more being printed, right? It's just being flooded uh, with currency, with US dollars, right? It, to a level where 10 years ago in 2000, and I can't remember, 2008, 2009, 10, they stopped reporting the M3, I believe, the monetary, how much money was being on the large scale, how much money was being dumped into the markets. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing the S&P, the S&Ps are this guy, the S&P at these levels, right? So let's take a look at Bitcoin as far as cryptocurrencies goes because they're, they're considered to be currency, but they're based on scarcity and to a certain degree, there, the hurdles that Bitcoin faces or cryptocurrencies face that are based on scarcity is to get them into circulation, to increase their velocity, okay? And once they increase their velocity, then what happens? They start changing hands more often. But since they're based on scarcity, most or a lot of people might be holding on to them, expecting for the value to go up because it's based on scarcity, right? Um, I gave you my opinion regarding cryptocurrencies, and right now I'm not holding any cryptocurrencies as of mid-July, okay? Um, and if you want to know my opinion regarding cryptocurrencies further, uh, that video is the place to be. And again, please keep this in mind. This is not financial advice, okay? So cryptocurrencies, the history of Bitcoin is this. Well, you can take a look at the history, but the price of Bitcoin is this, okay. In, I believe in 2008 or so, 2000 and 2009 or so, someone tried to sell 1,000 or 10,000 Bitcoins for $30 and there was no takers, okay. So it was very hard to get rid of your currency. It wasn't very liquid, right? Uh, It lacked liquidity and the liquid liquidity, and it was very volatile, and it is still very volatile. But in 2009, you couldn't really sell bitcoins. You know, we're talking about hundreds or thousands for a little bit of money. But in 2010, the price of bitcoin was six cents. Right? Again, we're off the scale. We're in the decimals here. Okay. So, six cents. Let's convert this to a dollar. So all we do is just one divided by six. Oops, not one divided by six, one divided by 0 0.06. You could have bought yourself, what? Oh, 100. 100 divided by six. You could have bought yourself 16. Yeah, 
you could have bought yourself uh, just checking making sure because in uh, uh, 2017 dollars six cents was only seven cents but that doesn't really make a difference so you could have bought yourself 16 bitcoins right so let's make this leave this as a dollar we got the bitcoin up there so one dollar one dollar in 2010 let's put that here one dollar in 2010 so that's 2020 2010 is right here that's 2000 so 2010 right here that's really when the game began for bitcoin okay and bitcoin right now the last i checked its price was around 20 2600 so if you bought 16 of them times 2600 oops 16 times 2600 is Forty-one thousand six hundred dollars. Forty-one thousand. Forty-one thousand six hundred dollars. Forty-one thousand six hundred dollars. Make sure I got all this correct. I don't want to give you guys the wrong data. Forty-one thousand six hundred. Okay, so we're here. Bitcoin, 48,000, 41,600. So we're here somewhere. Okay. In 2017. I'm going to put it a little bit off. No, no, let's put it on the line. Okay. Now, the slope of this. Is much steeper than the slope of this right much steeper how much steeper you could take the slopes you could take the slopes but I'm not really gonna get into that game right now basically the the multiple from these guys Renaissance was Renaissance was 260 230 let's say the multiple of Bitcoin is four one six zero zero divided by one forty the multiple of bitcoin is forty one thousand right this is what happens when you use trusted calculators you refer to them for the most simple calculations right so this was 230 and this slope is 41,000. this is blowing away anything else really okay superman was pretty good Superman is really good, right? Superman is fantastic. Oh, did I divide by 10 on this one? No, it was a multiple. It was $1. $1 of this, yeah. Same deal to a certain degree. Okay, so this is something you have to really keep in mind um, when it comes to economic systems at play. And... Uh, you know this ties into to what we are talking about in series four of the language of mathematics when we're talking about jumping from one system to another system because this is what we really have to keep in mind when we're thinking about personal finances is different economic games that play right and we just talked about two four six eight nine of them only nine right there are multiple other things you can invest your time and energy and your your funds and right there are different types of if you're thinking about buying a home there's real estate there's different types of real estate you could buy there are different types of cryptocurrencies you could buy there are different types of funds there are different types of comic books right this is one of the best returns but there are other comic books that have given you phenomenal return in shorter periods of time as well right walking dead or walking dead number one harbinger number one right um first appearance of venom, venom right first full appearance of an amazing uh, spider-man 300 right not phenomenal return like this one or walking that return but there are other returns saga number one those are shorter periods of time those are in this time frame we're talking about here right you know a few dollars investments gets you a few hundred or a few thousand right so if you're you know think about it which system are you functioning in if you're assisting and functioning in a lower down system where your returns aren't as much as you'd like then you can take a look at these systems see if they're 
models are valid, if you plan on saving to jump into those systems, or if you're in this system, there are lower down systems that are coming into play, which are going to surpass your growth rate, your, you know, over time will preserve your wealth or increase your wealth or a lot uh, better rate than the system you might be invested in, okay? And again, keep in mind that this isn't, um, this isn't financial advice. This is just quantifying the different economic systems we have at play and um, taking a look at how they vary because when it comes to personal finance, when it comes to wealth, we're thinking about growth. But this is only the things that seem tangible to us right now there are non-tangible to a certain degree things that we haven't quantified that are worth a lot worth more than this give you returns much more than this right there are different types of currencies at play this is the u.s dollar there are local currencies at play right when when certain economies to a certain degree go under stress all of a sudden disruptive innovation comes into play and new opportunities arise right Greece being one of them during the financial crisis for Greece where basically if you look at government statistics they give you unemployment rates that are huge they give you GDP that is very low all the stuff happening but GDP is a measure of what the government is keeping track of or can keep track of and the taxes that that they're collecting so GDP I know I'm going off a little bit here but we are going to touch up on on this stuff but I want to really emphasize the point um, using Greece as an example but Greece the GDP of a country is basically how much taxes a country is taking in and how much money they have how they're how they can manage their finances right they are they're basically looking at this but at a larger scale right but once the financial crisis hit Greece what happened was the taxes went up the services that the government was providing went down certain banks closed their doors they confiscated certain types of funds certain funds especially in cyprus right all of a sudden people have to scramble and had to uh adjust to the system and they basically came up with disruptive innovation and in greece there were basically barter systems put in place where uh, people were doing trade on a personal level right they weren't trading everything into a currency and then using the currency as the exchange of medium right the what they used to be able to trade between each other they just bypassed the currency and did straight trades and websites came into play and different types of technology came into play where people could go on there and offer certain goods or services and exchange those for other goods and services right this isn't the only thing in play everything is not necessarily measured in dollars or currencies that lose their value over time but since most of us are forced into the system we really have to think about other systems that have more potential more growth okay that will either preserve our wealth and um or give us a certain type of growth whatever type of growth we're thinking about and one of the most important things we have to keep in mind when we talked about the beginning of this video is make sure you diversify do not do not be in one system because if things go wrong some of these things may do a about turn and start having a negative return right devaluing losing their worth losing their you might start losing your wealth so make sure you're diversified but diversify in systems you either know right or systems where you can get the information and spend the time required to understand how the systems operate or hire someone to give you financial advice regarding whatever it is that you're planning on investing your time and energy on right i think that's enough yeah yeah that's a fair bit to think about and that's a good place for us to sort of do a pause uh, sort of finish off these set of videos anyway when it comes to personal finance um, it's pretty important
to think about these things and you know your weighting doesn't have to be the same in all of them you could do what the CPI does right have the measure your wealth invested a little bit in this a little bit in that a little bit in that a little bit in that and keep in mind things that are usually generally more steeper slope they have a faster income growth rate exponential growth rate that only lasts for a certain period of time keep your time frame in mind right are you gonna be invested for 117 years I don't think so average lifespan in the United States and Canada is I think for males anyway it's 82 high 70s let's say 80 mark for both Canada and the United States both male and female right well if you're 80 you know where are you gonna function for a certain period of that time you're a child right for certain that time you're not working right so what what's your work time frame timeline right from when have you started working to when can you continue working or will you continue working to generate income to invest in certain systems where you will not lose your wealth you will at least maintain your wealth right I hope um, this did a good little uh, summing up of what we talked about so far and what we have to keep in mind and this stuff is directly going to link into series four of the language of mathematics and we're going to talk a lot more about this and delve down into some of these systems one of the ones we're going to delve and give you a little heads up one of the ones we're going to delve into at some point is comic books and I've laid out some uh, videos a set of videos I'd like to do on that and basically quantify investing in comic books a little bit more than the way they've been quantified right now because it's very subjective of what a worth of a comic book is if you're in the industry if you know if you know what I'm talking about uh, the grading system is is one way people are going with slabbing comics and stuff like this but I'd like to take a look at the numbers and quantify some of those numbers and I've done some research into it and I've picked, picked put together some data some tables and uh, at some point we will be um, talking about this a lot more okay um, and I guess that's about it I hope you enjoyed this set of videos it was fun to create uh, it took a little bit of time um, sorry for the slow progression of these uh, of these videos but uh, I really lost myself in the data and really enjoyed looking at the stuff and trying to figure out a way of what a good way is to present this information okay and that's it for now i'll see you guys in the next video